The Things We All Carry is a podcast about first responders and their stories surrounding trauma on the job. The intention of this podcast is to raise awareness and share meaningful conversation around a subject often viewed as taboo or simply ignored. Be aware this content may be graphic and it is real. It may not be suitable for children or adults triggered by this subject matter. Welcome to episode 76 of The Things We All Carry. My purpose in life is to alleviate suffering. That's the mission statement of this week's guest. Dina, also known as Cop Shrink on Instagram, is a licensed marriage and family therapist in the state of California. Her focus is working with cops, firefighters, and the spouses of both. In addition, she responds to large scale or significant incidents requiring schism. In other words, she sees the first responder on their worst day. Dina has been in practice for 10 plus years and brings her own experiences of trauma and recovery as part of her toolkit. She's a rare therapist who speaks our language and has been touched by our traumas as well. Growing up, her grandfather was in law enforcement, eventually retired as chief of police, and she was married to a cop as well. Dina shares her personal story as well as professional. She is open and candid about topics such as abuse, marriage, divorce, addiction, faith, and recover. A quick reminder to please help us build a community which not only recognizes but supports each other through the struggles and recovery. Reach out through Instagram at the things we all carry or email my story at the things we all carry.com to offer support and share your story. Please remember to leave a review on iTunes and give a shout out to any first responder you know, love, or care about. Y'all enjoy the show. If you're ready, we can just have a conversation. I'm, I'm on your dime. With dime. All right, cool. All right, welcome back to the things we all carry. Today I have Dina, and Dina is better known as Cop Shrink on Instagram. That's where I found her. I assume that you have other spots on social media. Yes or no? I don't. No, just Instagram. I'm way too fragmented. I can't. I can't manage. Oh, I mean, I have a LinkedIn page, and I do have a Facebook page that I never go to. Um, but yeah, I, Instagram, I can stick to one. I can watch one show at a time. That's I got it. You. Instagram is it. <laughs> so if you guys want to, she's an interesting follow because there's a lot of good, I won't say free advice, but there's a words of wisdom she puts out there. So you guys go find her on Instagram. At, like I said, cop shrink on Instagram. So I'm going to let her share a little bit more of herself, a little brief intro, and then we'll get into some of her story and then some of what she's doing in life right now. Welcome to the show, Dina. Thank you so much for having me, Stack. This is such an honor. Um, well, so my name is Dina, uh, known as Cock Shrink on Instagram. I'm in Southern California. I have um, worked for a very large uh, contracting organization and get to work with hundreds and hundreds of first responder agencies all over the country. I am a post certified, so Peace Officer Standards of Training certified instructor. I do quite a bit of teaching at the basic academy and advanced academy level. Um, I respond to SISMs, critical incident stress management, uh, both locally and throughout the country for various city, state, federal agencies. And I'm a therapist and coach. And so I get to see people individually or in couples um, I can do a little bit of consulting on wellness programs for agencies. Um, that's that's me. That's what I do. Now, do you do you have to remain in in the state of California for for therapy and the, and the coaching, or or how does that work for you? So, as a licensed therapist, my license is in California. So, in order to do therapy to provide therapy services, it has to be with a California resident. Um, and someone who's in California, I learned like, if you're on vacation in Florida, I can't talk to you, which is super, super weird as a therapist, as a coach, I, I, it's international. I can, I can talk to someone in France just as easily as I can talk to someone in California because coaching is not about treating. Coaching is about encouraging, empowering, helping them build and grow versus therapy, which is more about stabilization. Okay, yeah, good because I was going to ask you the difference between that then because yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I would imagine there can be a fine line between the two, and you just have to you have to be on top of the game. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the fine line comes in when you recognize the person is really struggling with where they're at. 
So when and there is no growth without safety, right? So safety has to come first. And if they're not feeling safe, if they're not in a safe place, and I know it sounds a little bit woo-woo, but safety in their own body, safety in their own mind, um, safety in, you know, where they're at physically in, in their life, um, without that, there is no growth. So safety has to come first. It's weird because as a therapist to first responders, so many of the, the people that I interact with, they're not mentally ill. They're not unsafe or struggling for the most part. They're very well um, adapted to their what they're experiencing. And so I do have to be very careful and listen and assess really well to determine is there something that needs treatment and stabilization? And sometimes there is. Um, but once there is, then then a lot of growth happens after that. And as a therapist, I can't be a coach, which is weird um, because there, I, that's where the overlap happens, right? If I have a, a, a very, a, a person that's doing well, they're not suffering, they don't have symptoms of mental health challenges, then they're ready to grow. So, but I don't kick them out of therapy, right? I'm like, okay, we're, we're just working on some other things now. So my kind of my college education coming back, we're talking basically, we're talking those basic needs, like the hierarchy of needs from, from Maslow. Exactly. And, and, and if you can't have those established, so establishing those are more of a, of a therapeutic level, yes. we're getting above that, where that actualization comes from a coaching standpoint. You got it. I nailed it. That's exactly it. Yeah. You nailed it. Yeah. You nailed it. Well, maybe I got an A in that <laughs> class. I don't know. Uh, so where did, where were you born? Where, where'd you grow up? What was family life like? Mm. So I was, I've been Southern California native my whole life. I was born in, um, in Southern California in Los Alamitos actually. And that's notable because my grandfather was the chief of police there and he had started with LA County Sheriff's department, um, promoted through the ranks, moved over, became chief of Los Alamitos police department, really tiny little agency. Um, and my mom was 16 and my dad was 19 and was just drafted to Vietnam. So um, life was rough, you know, in the very beginning. Um, I would say zero to 14 was incredibly tumultuous, chaotic, um, abusive, painful. Um, and, and that was the 70s. Like in, in that era, I think most of us in this Gen X didn't really question. We were just like, well, I guess this is just the way it is. I mean, I saw other families and I'm like, well, you have air conditioning. <laughs> well, you have like dinner. You guys like sit down and have dinner. Like, that's weird. How cool would that be to have? And you guys don't fight or yell or throw things and break things. Ambulance doesn't come to your house every month. Like, interesting. But I never thought that I needed help or that something was wrong. It was just the way my life was, you know? So that was, you said zero to 14. What happens at 14? At 14, um, my mom marries a, a wonderful man who was a therapist and we moved. The, the moving part was horribly traumatic. We moved from the beach inland. Um, and oh, but believe me, talk about the bullying from my beach friends my, that I grew up with. I was called an inlander <laughs> and you do not want to be called an inlander. Um, and it was really hot and I didn't know anybody and it was really sort of in the middle of nowhere. And but my life got significantly better um, after the first year or two of growing pains of, of settling into that Um uh, my new stepdad was very kind and loving and used big words and talked about feelings. And I hated it at first, but then realized looking back, you know, once I finally got out of there at 18, you know, started living on my own, I recognized how grateful um, I was to have had such a safe place to become a teenager and become an adult. Um, it was really exactly what I needed. So you mentioned that you leave at 18. Yeah. Do you go to college or what, what, what is it you leave yeah. for? Yeah, I went to, I didn't leave the area. I actually, um, I had started dating my high school sweetheart at 17 and he was already in college locally and, and working his family business. And I, my parents moved, they were sort of like, well, we're moving. You can come with us if you want. I'm like, 
I, there's no bedroom for me if I even did move and it's out of the area. And well, how convenient is that? <laughs> right? It was like, yeah, I guess you're, it's time for you to go right. now. Um, so I got my own apartment. Um, but then a year later I was engaged. And then a year after that I was married. And um, so I did go to college uh, locally um, and got my bachelor's degree. For my senior year, I, I got pregnant um, and uh, I was, had already been married for like four years um, and then had my son and, you know, continued on the adult life path. I didn't go back to graduate school until way, way, way later. Um, so it's, life happened and we got divorced and then now we're trying to raise a kid together and co-parent and I just went into work mode. Um, got married again right away and that was my cop that I married um so I say from cop wife to cop shrink um but being a cop wife was was certainly challenging learning what that was all about started to really understand the challenges my mom had told me about growing up in her home when you know her dad my grandpa was was a police officer um so living that in that anxiety and that fear and concern um but it certainly set me up for being able to help other cop wives yeah i was going to ask about that because i've i've done a couple of episodes with spouses and it's interesting to get the the, the opposite view not the opposite but the 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 back side of the coin view of what it's like to be a first responder and uh it, obviously you've got that you've got that little bit of personal wisdom from from being a wife of a cop and so like you said it, it is I can only imagine what it's like to be a, the wife or a husband of a cop versus of a firefighter. Yeah, there's dangers enough as, in firefighting, but cops face a, a different kind of danger, obviously. Yeah. And I, you know, I remember um, I never had some of the problems that, um, I, like, we never fought. I, I never complained about overtime. I never, you know, said, where are you? Why are you still at the station? I, I really joined the blue line family. Like I joined the mission. Um, and, um, that was really important to me to be able to support him. I, I feel like I had to be in it with him. Right. And, but I remember the day we had, it was my first line of duty death funeral. And I went with my husband at the time while he was in uniform representing his, his agency. And it hit me for the first time. Wow. This is real. Like you can die in the line of duty. And I was crying and like really scared about this. And he just so calmly just sort of looked over at me and said, that's never going to happen. I'll always come home. And even if it was a lie, right, I needed to hear that. I right. needed that reassurance that don't worry about it. That's not going to happen to me so that I wasn't living in fear. And it was I was very relieved. Like I was like, oh, OK, good. You're always going to come home. Good. That'll never happen to you. That's a. Uh... If you can believe it, that's, that's a good piece of advice. But I mean, it's so yes. it's, that's a rough thing to try and believe, right? Oh, it's, but it's imperative. Right. You, you have to believe that because you can't live in fear of, of what you don't want to happen. You now, can't. It's not sustainable. Do you only work, do you work with any of, of spouses of, of, of first responders now? I do quite and, a bit. And is that, is that a huge part of the, I don't, I don't want to say battle because it's not necessarily a battle. They're a huge part of what they're trying to, to work on or is that a piece of it? No, honestly, honestly, that's less, it sounds weird to say, but I wish that was more of a problem for okay. them. It's more of the taking for granted their life and taking for granted um, that they do come home every day or every, you know, two days if they're on shift in a firehouse. Um, I almost want to impart to my spouses, like, do you know he can leave today and not come home? So treat him better. Get along better. Uh, join the mission. Be so kind. Be loving. Always leave with a loving word, you know? It's almost a reminder of, of what it could be. Right, right. Because often the, you know, the challenges challenges that I see with first responder spouses is a lot of that my life is so awful and this is so hard and they're such assholes and, um, you know, they don't understand how hard it is for me. And um, I don't want to minimize their hard. I get it. But I also want to sort of expand their perspective and say, gosh, in the grand scheme of things, the hard is, is really a, a small part of 
what could be if you don't figure this out, right? Interesting. Work and get together and and working together on this hard and recognize every day is precious. Like every day you're together is is a gift. Is is don't take that for granted. So I know we're kind of jumped ahead there because you, there's a huge chunk of story before you even get to be a therapist, correct? Hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah. Were we talking about that? And were we talking about? Well, not yet, but we're going to now, right? <laughs> so, okay. so, so how do you go from being cop wife to cop shrink and why? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, the, the, the seed was planted so many years prior, even prior to going to college for the first time, I had seen Lethal Weapon in the movie theater. And this was a pivotal moment because, um, while I was watching that movie, I knew that's what I was, I needed to be. I knew that was my calling. That was my purpose to be that shrink in the, in the police station, which I'm not in a police station, but you know, that chick that was always trying to get Griggs to come talk to her because he was losing his mind and wanting to eat his gun and all of this. And like, yeah, give me the hardest job. That's the one I want. But I really struggled to believe that I was worthy of that really struggled to believe that I could be good at it or be effective um, because of all that I had dealt with. I mean, I have an ACES score of 10. Like I'm a perfect 10. Um, I'm sure you've talked about ACE on this. this. Uh, It has been, it has been a a while ago. Got it. So ACEs is, it stands for adverse childhood events and there are 10 items. And so you can get a score of zero to 10 and you don't want a big number on ACEs um, because the the studies, the data that came out of this big research of adverse childhood events says that the higher your ACE score, the more susceptible or prone you are to addiction. Okay. Um, and that was certainly true for me. Um And and we didn't know about ACEs, you know, maybe just five years ago, a little bit more than five years ago. Um, And so because of my childhood, I thought I can't possibly be effective. Um, Who am I? Like, I I basically trailer trash. Like, how how can I be useful and effective in this in this space? So I when I went to therapy on my own is when I really learned like, whoa, what had happened to me, how it negatively affected me and how I can really use it to help other people. I remember my therapist um, said to me um, when I said, how can I possibly help others? How can I possibly, um, you know, do this work as a therapist when I've had so much crap in my life? And he said to me, who better? That's, I mean, that's a great point, right? exactly what I needed to hear. And, and he said also, um, so this was right before I decided to go to graduate school. And he said, you would make a great therapist right now, right now, without any schooling, you'd be phenomenal at it. He goes, yeah, you got to go to school and get the degree and get the license and, and do all of that. But you are already a fantastic therapist. And it blew my mind. I had never had anybody believe in me so much to to be so kind and share with me their experience of me you know that's it's ironic because you're the second uh show in a row that i've heard someone say that i've never heard i've never had somebody just tell me you can do it yeah and so it's a powerful statement oh so powerful all right so how do you get to school how do i get to school yeah When, when do you start you know what's life like then um I don't know. Where, where do you go to grad school at? Yeah, wow, that's a, that's, that's such a great, you're asking such great questions that I've never really explored before. No one's asked me about. Um, I, I went to Cal Baptist, California Baptist University. Um, it was local um, and I could go at night. So when I, I didn't go back to school until my husband at the time, funny enough, he was a cop turned veterinarian. So he had an incident on the job that he got injured and it wasn't a career ending injury. It was enough, but it was enough to wake him up and say, whoa, I don't know that I want to keep doing this. Like he'd already been a cop for 10 years and was like, these bad guys are not getting any older, but I am, Yeah, you know, and um, he had always wanted to be a veterinarian. That was like his little childhood dream and the encourager cheerleader that I am. I'm like, go for it. What are you, what are you waiting for? 
he's all oh, I'm old. Like, doesn't matter. Like time goes by whether you're in school or not. Um, we're doing fine. We'll, we'll be fine. Go for it. Um, and I always say like famous last words for the first six years, I signed up for a very hard task, very mm. hard life. Um, I was working full time. He was working full time at the police department, um, working nights and he would finish his shift, drive to school, sleep in his car and then go to school. And he did that for like a year yeah. until we felt like financially comfortable to say, okay, you can, you can leave now. Um, and I remember the struggle he had with leaving. And I, I tell this with a lot of my guys that are now debating about leaving the job, leaving as a fireman or leaving as a police officer, leaving before retirement or even retiring early and the struggle they, they have with it. I'm like, oh, I lived this struggle. I remember he mm -hmm. was so, he felt defeated. He felt a little bit like he was giving up or quitting. He felt like he was leaving his guys on the front lines and he was abandoning them. And so it took a long, uh, quite a while for him to really feel confident that leaving was a good idea. And um, I remember the conversations we had and I said, go to your guys and tell them what you want to do and, and just have that conversation and tell them, I feel bad for leaving you. I don't want to leave you on the front lines. I feel like I should stay in the fight with you. And all of them were like, get out of here, like go. <laughs> Don't, don't stay here. We're fine. We love you, but go, you know, go do better. So for six years, I, I had, I managed uh, the two businesses that I had opened and um, was raising my son. And then we welcomed a daughter um, and um, it was a lot of work and I was alone a lot, but I was, again, I was sort of in it. I was in the mission. And when he got close to graduation, is when um, I went back to school. I was like, okay, my turn. I'm going to go back to school. It's, and I don't want to get sidetracked, but I, I, I do want to touch on that, that feeling of, do I leave or not? And, and 10 years is, is a long time to be a cop. It's a long time to be a firefighter, but obviously then you kind of, you kind of get into that. I, I, I like to call it that cost loss, that, that loss benefit or, or an analysis where you're thinking, but if I put 10 years in, am I throwing 10 years of my life away if I leave today? And I've been trying to have this conversation on the show and off where it's, you're not throwing 10 years of your life away. You've gained 10 years of experience doing something. Let's see what you can do with that experience somewhere else. And somewhere that maybe that your, your body and mind are better suited at this point in your life. And right. it's funny because I, I say that, but, uh, to be honest, I've been, I've been walking around with, with my papers in my bag for about a month now. And it was dated. I have a certain, I'm not going to say the date because everyone that listens that I work with, are going to freak out, but there's, there was a date on there, but now I still have to change that date just because of, of the way logistics work out. But it's the same thing. I'm sitting here and I preach it. If it's your turn to go, it's your turn to go. But I'm sitting here hesitant to go, even though I, I'm there. So right. I, it's, I know firsthand, I just think it's very ironic that this comes up in this conversation today. So it's, I think I have a, a special, nah, I won't say special. I have an insight on how that feels. Right, right. And you know that tug and that pull and that fear and that anxiety. I always get this vision, this picture in my mind with this particular struggle. Should I go or should I not? Should I leave? Should I not? Um, and maybe you've seen this little cartoon picture where Jesus is trying to give this little girl a really big, no, no, no. The little girl is holding on to her little bear. And behind Jesus's back is this huge bear. And she's like, but I don't want to let it go. And she has no idea that Jesus has something even bigger for her. Right. Right. But she's like, no, but this is comfortable. This is safe. I know this. I know how to do this. Mm -hmm. And he's like, just give it to me. Just put it down. Just let that go. She's afraid to let go of what she knows, but, but can't and, and can't yet see that there's something even bigger and even greater for her. Yeah, that, that comfort is is such an addiction for, for everybody because oh. every two weeks there's I know there's a check coming in and, and I know what size Jeez. it's going to be and I can affect that by how much I work or don't work. So, yeah, yeah that, that's, it's very, I mean, it's that, it's that reinforcement. We won't yeah. get into my behavior stuff, but it's all about that reinforcement. So, yeah. uh, but no, I think it's very fascinating because I, I, I do have that first firsthand insight on what that's like. And, and uh, I think... Uh, I think the lyric is from Zach Bryan and he says something about the best time to go is when the going scares you. 
Ooh. So, and it's, it's, yeah, it's just that it, it's, if you want to be tested, go get tested, you know, go test yourself. Right. So right. anyway, so how does school go for you? What you sign up for? What kind of, what kind of degree was it? Um, so the degree was in counseling psychology, the okay. master's of science in counseling psychology, which they call the MFT track or marriage family therapist Got track. It. Okay. Um, and initially I, I started before or yeah I started before he went to veterinary school and um I was even in my practicum so the first I finished the first year um and it was time to you know go to work and do practicum stuff you know practice what I'm learning and I had an internship at the Betty Ford Center uh, which was really really cool and I was opening the doors of my second business and was just overwhelmed. I was drowning. Um, he had quit his job. He had started veterinary school and um, I was trying to, you know, raise my son, take care of my business, open this second business. We had a rental property. Um, I was just drowning in, in too much stuff. And so I thought, all right, let me take a break. I'm just going to take a break put this on pause. I'll come back to it. I'm, I'm not going to lose anything. And so I went back um, five years later. So for five years, you know, I managed the businesses. Uh, we welcomed a daughter. Um, he was finishing school. Um, and so when I went back, it was funny because one of my classmates when I started was now one of my professors, <laughs> which was a little bit, um, hard so to that's be like bittersweet at the at best a little like oh so cool to see you dang i could right. be here right now but exactly. i'm not you know i'm a struggling student um and it was hard graduate school is really really hard there is so much writing like writing 10 pages 15 pages 30 page papers and i always felt inadequate i always felt like oh i could have done better or, you know, and I have ADHD pretty severely. So, of course, I would wait until my hair was on fire, until like it was due the next day. And then I would, you know, jam it out. Oh, I can and relate. I get, right. And I would get like an A or even a B, but I would say, yeah, I could have done better. Mm -hmm. I could have done better. Had I started a month ago, I could have done so much better. And that was like the story of my <laughs> my graduate school life. It was always, Dina, you could be doing better. Like, what's wrong with you? Why do you wait till the last minute? You know? Um but thank God it, it, it was over and I finished. And it was one of the proudest moments, you know, walking across that stage and getting this master of science degree. I was really proud. And, um, but I, I wasn't, I wasn't ready yet to go to work. I was still, I had at this point now sold my businesses and was staying home with my kids and, um, you know, just like sort of doing life. And that all of that busyness. So I thought, well, it's not time for me to like um, go to work right now. I don't want to. It's my kids are little. I want to stay home. And and so it would be another two. Well, my husband at the time and I were were not doing so well. And it was looking like we were headed toward divorce. And of course, we were trying to thwart that and um, doing all the things we could to try to repair and and, and get back on a track that would be forever. But that didn't work it out. So I, in the last year when we separated, so 2011 is when I joined uh, the organization that I work with now. And um, yeah, and then life, life changed. Life got really different. And as an intern, um, any, any intern will tell you now they're called associates, mm -hmm. but um, it is rough because for the most part, and maybe it's not everybody, but for the most part, you don't get paid hardly anything. Like, and and maybe it was the time that I was doing this, but the, the belief was like, you are lucky to get to work to collect hours because you have to collect, you know, 3000 hours before the state board will even consider testing you to get your license. You have to have all that practice and supervision and man, so for six years, I was an intern. Now, it shouldn't take six years. It should only take two years. But life happened and it got really yucky and awful. And so it took what it took. But six years is significant because at that mark, at least in the state of California, at that mark, 
your first year of hours drops off. Uh, you don't get to count that anymore. So you only get to count the previous six years of gotcha. hours. So you and came I up on a working quite a. As I say, you came up on a time where you had to finish. Uh, yes. Oh, yes. I had to test and, and I didn't pass the first time. So that's why the six years also. And I, I came up on like this, like I remember taking this last test. And when I say the test, like the test is four hours mm. and we take like literally down to the last 10 seconds to finish that test. It's a, it's hard. And I was in that test and controlling my anxiety and, and trying not to get, say to myself, okay, this is it. Like if you don't pass, you're going to lose this whole, that whole first year of hours and start all over and submit more hours than all this. So a lot of pressure, but I passed and got licensed and kept doing it. And, and you've, you've made mention to life changing or, or, and, and I know you've had, you had some, so you had at least one major event happen and it kind of snowballs, correct? Which major event? Well, like, yeah. So many major. Uh, well, events. how about you? Then I'll just step out of your way and let you tell the stories. How about that? Oh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't even know which major event you're referring to. Well, how about you just follow a timeline? Course. How about that? Okay. All right. Well, I mean, certainly the first major event was the divorce. That was really, really hard, really painful. Um, I lost a lot. I don't take divorce lightly, and it's incredibly painful. That why I'm, I'm crying because, of course, my mind is like all of the things that I lost, mm. not just the the hope of happily ever after and forever, but, you know, the family and friends and community that we had built together. And, um, you know, they don't tell you all of that in divorce. They don't tell you of, um, you know, friends picking sides and they don't tell you how painful it is for your kids. Um, I didn't want to cry. <laughs> well. um, so that was certainly a major uh, pain point to survive and the best way I knew how I got right into a relationship again too soon I say again because I hadn't been alone since I was 17 mm -hmm. and now here I was two marriages deep you know, 23 years of my adult life and getting into a relationship again without even like taking a pause to breathe. And um, I got swept up and I, this is the time where I thought I'd moved to Florida because that's where he was from. And it was the best time of my life. I had never been so happy. I, we were doing all the things that I love to do. I love to be active and kayak and backpack and camp and travel and go all over the place with adventures and um there was a lot of drinking involved which is probably pretty notable and um and I was you know still trying to work I was a brand new intern and um we got engaged after 13 months and he had moved back to Florida with the expectation that he would either move back or I would move there um but me moving there was looking like less of a possibility because my ex-husband was like, you're not taking my daughter. So if you go, you're leaving without her. And I was like, I, I'm not willing to do that. So the expectation was he was going to move back to Florida. And, you know, I should have seen all the red flags, but I didn't um, until, you know, sort of one fateful moment where I, I had had some suspicions as I hadn't heard from him on my travel home from Miami back home to California, I hadn't heard from him. And usually we touch base every time I change planes or when I get in my car or whatever, when I get home and I hadn't heard from him all night. So I went to sleep that night praying, God, I just need clarity. Like, tell me what's up. Like, I need clarity on this relationship. And I woke up to an oops text. Mm. The oops text that was meant for someone else, but it got sent to me. And I immediately was like, there's my answer. So I messaged him back. So how much should I insure the ring for? Cause I'm mailing it back. And he didn't let that go. And for a month we were sort of back and forth of, you know, he's so sorry. And, um, he's an idiot and, you know, he's got a problem, a sex addiction, blah, blah, blah. It turns out he'd been treating on me the whole time, 13 months of our relationship, 14 months now of our relationship. And, um, ending that was really painful of course, cause I thought, 
ooh, good, here's my knight in shining armor. And that's sort of laughable because it, it wasn't like that. And some of the red flags were like, none of my friends liked him. None of my family liked him, which I was like, yeah, you just don't understand. You don't, you don't understand him. Um, and so that, that was another pivotal, like, turning point or, or pain point for me, because here now I'm a new therapist and I'm, and I'm like, what is wrong with me? Like, I can't figure my shit out. Like I can't, I can't pick the right person. I, I jumped into a relationship too soon. Um, I'm sacrificing time with my kids to pursue this relationship. Like what, I, what am I doing? Um, so tried to, you know, kind of patch myself together and fix my little broken heart, which I, probably have never recovered. I became very avoidant after that. Like, I can't trust myself. I can't trust men. I, I, so I struggled sort of in and out of relationships, um, nothing long lasting. Um, and then the big whammy hit. The big whammy was uh, my dad was murdered. And this was coming off the heels of, of that major uh, tragedy. And the stacking of, sorry, stack, <laughs> stacking of all of the traumas of being a first responder therapist, you know, multiple baby deaths and shootings and officer involved shootings and mass casualties. And I had worked the LAX terminal um, shooting in 2013. And while I was at LAX uh, working for Department of Homeland Security and TSA, um, I was there for five days. And what's weird is being sent on a deployment, you know, packing a bag for a day or two and then being like, yeah, you're not leaving. Like you right. can't leave for five days. And I had a gallbladder attack. And the whole time I was debriefing TSA agents, uh, 1500 between me and my, my team that was there for five days, I was in excruciating pain. Like I doubled over, like it felt like ribs were broken. Like it was that painful. Um, so all of that stacking going on. And then 2014, um, I get the call that my dad was murdered. My life just, I spun, I just spun because it's something I never expected. I always expected that when he went back into prison, um, and it, he was an old hippie drug addict from Vietnam. Like he, he just never recovered from serving. Um, and, and ensnared in drug addiction. He never recovered and never got on his feet. And when he would go back to prison for drug violations, parole violations, I would breathe a sigh of relief thinking, oh, he's safe now. Right. You know? um, at least he's got three hots in a cot and no one's going to try to kill him. And, you know, he's safe and warm and, you know, he's not using drugs and maybe he'll find Jesus and he'll get sober and things will be good. And, so getting that call June 29th, 2014 was just the biggest gut punch in my life. And I didn't do well. I didn't handle it well. I had no resources. I had no, no um, family of support. You know, I was single and a struggling broke intern. And, and like, I felt like there was two faces of me, you know, one at work all put together and I'm supposed to be the helper here or the teacher or the instructor. And, and, you know, home, I was just falling apart. I was just a mess. Um, and, you know, to, to top that off, I had accepted a job, a stable job. You know, you talked about that stable paycheck and right. benefits and I wanted that. And the life of a contractor is not stable at all. There's no security. There's no stability or consistency. And so I had accepted a job at a, at a large county agency and given my notice for the contracting work that I did within that space of my dad being murdered. Literally four days later, I was told that the job fell through with the large county agency. And when I went back to my employer, she had already replaced me with two other interns. So I had no job now. So no job. Yeah. Dad was murdered. No husband. No, you know, system of support because all I did was work all the time. And so in my mind, I was like, fuck it. 
I can use drugs now. No one cares. It doesn't matter. I don't work for law enforcement. I don't work for fucking anybody. I'll, I'll just, I don't give a shit. And I circled the drain. Um, thankfully, it was short-lived, but it was a very hard, hard, short-lived um, experience. Um, I, I remember <clears throat> at one point having to count the number of drinks I was, I was having. Um, that no one tells you this. Like, if you go to rehab, they're going to ask you how much you drink. And I'm like, I drink a lot. Why do you think I'm here? Like, I need help. Um, and uh, it, it, by the way, struggling into the rehab, um, of course, you know, you, you, you hit that moment of bottom, which I like to say you hit bottom when you stop digging. I, d I don't know that I felt that at the time. I certainly didn't feel like that. It felt like this is it. Like I can't get any lower than this. This was bad. Or I guess I recognize this is as bad as I want it to get. I don't want to go any further than this. And um, I was driven to to rehab and the guy said, how can we help you? And I thought that was the stupidest question, like the most ridiculous, obvious question. I was like, what, what, do, you, what do you think you could do for me? Like, I'm here. I look like shit. I need help. I'm at rehab. What do you, what do you mean? And um, he said, you know, well, how, you know, I think he wanted me to say it. And I remember the words I said, I just want to live. Mm. And I think it was the first time I've ever said that. I just want to live. And um, in that intake process, they ask you, you know, how, what, what's your drug of choice? What are you and how much are you using? And for me, it was primarily alcohol, but I would use anything I could get my hands on to just not feel what I was feeling and um, started calculating it. And it was like, well, it used to only be Friday and Saturday nights. Then it became Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights. Then it became Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights, and oh, sometimes Sunday. And like we started stacking and counting. And I think at the time it was like, you know, 300, 400 drinks a month or something. And they were like, holy shit, you know? Um, and that was a shock um, to even me. Like, how could I have been consuming so much? Um, I'm not sure where I, I started going down that road for a reason. I don't remember what it was for, but. Um, so. You say it was a short, short time. What, what, what kind of time period was it? So my, my dad's murder was, was June 29th, 2014. And I walked into rehab in February of 2015. Okay. So six months, seven months. Six months. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting because the priming happened back when I was a teenager. Right. You know, exactly. certainly not the first time I touched drugs and alcohol. I smoked my first joint at like nine yeah and drank my first drink at like 12 or 13 yeah and drank a lot and smoked a lot and weed was very different back then it was, <laughs> you know i called that dirt weed oh it was definitely um, dirt weed trust me <laughs> right but it was and i i recall the dirt weed i get because it's just so different from what's available now like mm -hmm. now we're talking like it's space weed like this shit will <laughs> knock you out especially in california um, oh my <laughs> gosh it's insane i didn't i i didn't recognize that anyway um so i say dirt weed like it was nothing like i thought i was getting high but compared to what mm -hmm. you can get now which i don't touch it um it's just crazy insane um what was I saying? Uh, we were out. just talking about the, the six or seven months. That, that months. It was it was that brief period, but it was intense and in that you were oh, identifying the, the what, priming. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and so I, I, I stopped using any kind of I, I didn't drink or use drugs from the age of 16 on. Really, I never I didn't touch a drink or a drug until later, closer into my 30s. Um, but. You know, there's sort of a phrase that says when you when you stop, you know, your addiction is doing push ups in the in the parking lot waiting for you sort of mm -hmm. sort of thing. And so the priming had happened when I was really young, which would later be my default and sort of pick up where it left off. So I could drink with the toughest men. You know, I was putting away so much alcohol. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that that um that priming is 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 very real. Um, even if you don't, even if you don't end up in rehab, that priming is very, very real. 
Um, oh yeah. I know that I, I think we, we discussed Florida a little bit before we came on air and, and the fact that I, that I kind of grew up there. Well, I grew up there from fourth grade and a fourth grade on. And, and my first experience with alcohol was, was fifth grade, you know, and it was, it was, we stumbled upon it we drank and I was like, well, that was kind of fun. You know, that was right. it, it, as a, as an introvert and, and new to a, new to a place, it was that allowed me to interact with people on a, on a different level than I was able to on my own. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and it's been a journey, you know, with alcohol, it's always been a journey with alcohol because it's just so prevalent in society. So it's the easiest thing to do. Right. 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 And I'm, yeah, I'm go ahead. No, you're good. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I'm, I'm so grateful to be on the other side of that. Like, um, I can't say I've been, you know, hundred percent abstinent since 2015. I was certainly completely didn't touch any mood altering anything um I, from from rehab until 2017 but that's when the murder trial um mm -hmm. started and i was like yeah i can't fucking do this sober like that there's no way and although i i really didn't you know get drunk i was like i i need a little little edge or i need to get the edge off to to manage this and then i sort of like tiptoed back into let's see if i can drink let, mm -hmm. let let's just see and I, I guess I could say I did fine. I didn't really do fine, but I, I didn't get to a point of out of control. I can't, you know, do this anymore. And I really embarked on a journey of, of healing and growth and, um, got, got a lot into, um, the Buddhist philosophy and understanding what that looked like and stoicism and recognizing like i'm just looking to feel better well i think i can feel better without a substance so let me figure out how i can do that and uh it, it was really through that growth in meditation and growth in you know buddhist philosophy and um and stoicism of recognizing i don't need substances i really i really don't and sort of fast forward um Anytime I would try to drink, I would have like one or maybe two, I would get deathly ill. Like I would be incredibly sick, physically sick. And so I sort of think of that as like, oh, that's kind of nice. I'm, I'm kind of glad that I, I don't even desire it. And now, so at the time I was like pissed, like, why can't I drink? Now I get sick. This is annoying. I want to just be able to drink. And, and again, along my, my journey of, of growth and maybe that actualization, I don't know what that looks like, but I think I, I don't even want it. I have no desire for it. I, I, I want to be present. I want to be in it. I want to master any kind of difficulty that I experience in the moment rather than checking out and using a substance to numb it. You know, I want to master it. Hey guys, quick break right here just to check in and thank each of you for listening to the show. Your support has been paramount and I appreciate all of you. I have one request though. I need you to share the show with everyone you know. Help me get the word out and spread these stories as far and as wide as we can. While you're at it, please leave a review of the show wherever you happen to listen. Feel free to reach out to me at any time to share your story, to talk, or to pass on suggestions. Let's get on with the rest of the show. Not again, I can go so many ways with this. I, I, I haven't had an interesting thought because throughout this conversation, you've talked about faith and you're not, not directly, but very, you know, you've made mention to, to, to Jesus and to, to faith and, and to a belief and then to go with stoicism and Buddhism. How do you, how do you meld the two other oh, three or four together? And, and do you, are, I know it's just an interesting concept to me. Yeah. I thank you for, for for asking that, for touching on that, um, because they, first they didn't meld together. Um, after my dad was murdered, I, that's when my crisis of faith really began. And I was really angry and, uh, angry at God. I'm like, if there is a God, he is sick and mean and cruel. And why would he allow this to happen? And I couldn't wrap my brain around it. And I would say, you know, how do I accept the unacceptable? Does it make any sense to me? Um, I can't accept this. And I can't accept that a God would allow this. And I just couldn't 
figure it out. And I was so angry for, for really, I remember it was like 18 months because I remembered noticing I wasn't as angry anymore. So for 18 months, like out of rehab, um, I was so angry. I, I wanted to hit things. I wanted to fight with people and I didn't do any of that. I just, that's what I felt inside. And I had to direct that anger somewhere. I had to be able to express it. And so I opened an Instagram account right out of rehab just as a place to sort of like a stream of consciousness journal to just throw my shit out there and to say the, say the F word. Uh, I, I felt like that was safe. Like it didn't matter. Nobody knew me. I didn't care. And so I was just profanity and anger and yelling. And once in a while, I would land on some insights and encouragement. And I never intended to grow a following. Like it was literally a selfish thing for me to just put my shit out there. Um, I didn't really even want to be identified in the beginning. But um, over time, like in the first week, I had 100 followers and I didn't know these people. And then the next week, next month, I had a thousand and then 5,000 and then 7,000. I was like, what the hell is happening? People were saying to me, you're saying all the things I'm feeling. You're speaking what I've been experiencing for years. You know, you putting out what you're putting out helps me. Um, I feel so seen and heard and keep doing what you're doing and started feeling a little pressure like, I'm not doing anything. I, I'm, I'm like certainly not here to encourage or and empower you. Like I'm here to just spill and vent. And um, and and so I it was like thirteen thousand followers. And at the time, you know, it's kind of a big deal. Now it's like that's nothing. Yeah, right. Um, right. And and then when I, you know, when the when my dad's murder trial hit and I was drinking again, I felt very, um very much like a fraud, like a hypocrite. Like, how can I be preaching or talking about sobriety when here I was drinking again? Because there's really, you know, like sobriety is black or white. Like if, right, in the in the recovery community, it's either you're completely abstinent or you're completely drunk. Like there is no in between. And I was having a hard time buying that now because I wasn't out of control. And, but you don't tell that to recovery people. They're just like, yeah, just wait, you know, just wait. You're not sober, you know, we'll, we'll save a seat for you. And, you know, all of that talk. But um, I just started feeling like I, I'm I'm not, it's served its purpose. Like Instagram has now served its purpose and it's time to close it up and um, close that chapter. And I recognize it was such a healing experience for me to be able to express that anger. And so my crisis of faith was was really horrible. I think there was even a period of time where I felt like an atheist, like there is no God, there's no such thing. It's all bullshit. And it was such a stark contrast from where I came from. You know, I became a Christian at 16. I served in ministry in the church. Um, in my twenties and thirties, uh, I was on praise teams. I sang in bands. Like I, I was on, you know, prayer ministry. It was a really big piece of my life. And so to now be like, oh yeah, there is no God, um, was a really odd place to be. And then I would sort of be like, well, I don't know what I believe. Maybe I believe, maybe I'm agnostic. There is, there's something bigger. I don't know what it is. And, you know, it wasn't until this past year. So there was no melding for me. There was no, and, and I recognize Buddhist, for me, Buddhism wasn't a religion. It was a philosophy and it really, but it really resonated with me. And refuge recovery um, was a significant um, component of healing for me because it came from the place of, yeah, we're struggling with addiction and this is how we have got found recovery and ref refuge recovery is, built on that Buddhism philosophy. And it was a huge um, healing piece for me. And so, you know, sort of fast forward now bringing into like 2022, my crisis of faith um, it sort of stopped. And actually, I don't remember what year, but in the last few years, I felt myself slowly turning back to um, my my Christian faith and 
still this like, yeah, but I'm not going to church. Like church is a business. I don't want to be a part of that. They have hurt me. I felt rejected and and not welcomed and I don't want to be there anymore. And I don't, I don't like, I don't want to ascribe to that. And strangely enough, I started diving into uh, the works of manifestation and understanding what manifestation is. And I want to learn more. And there's still, you know, Christians would be like, oh, that's witchcraft. And, you know, stay away from that. But what's weird is that diving into that brought me right back to my Christian faith. And I'm like, manifestation is more aligned with Christianity and Christian faith than anything else I've ever seen. Um, and, you know, someone's over here. If And anyone's listening, they're probably like, heretic, you know, like blasphemy. But for me, that's what brought me back to, um, okay, there, there, there is a God and, and Jesus is real. And um, I, I have come back sort of full circle, not really excited about necessarily practicing that in an organized, an organized way, like in church. Um, but it, it certainly um, I'm back to where my faith was before. Um, maybe a little more open-minded and recognizing that there isn't one truth, which again, sort of, you know, for some groups would be like blasphemy, but I don't think there is one truth. I think religion practices in multiple different ways to get to the one truth, which for me, my faith is, you know, there is one God Um, and all the different religions, they're all doing that to get to the one God. They just do it differently. Um, and what's weird is I recognized in so many parts of my life, you know, in this time when I was, um, in my crisis of faith and, um, even, you know, when I was drinking and I, I knew God was a presence in my life. I saw the evidence of God in my life, which was weird because I was like, I told you to leave me alone. Mm. Don't, don't mess with my life. You're not welcome here. I don't want you here anymore. Leave me alone. And yet when I needed it the most, it was like, oh, that was weird. That was so God. Huh. Anyway, blah. You know, I would sort of just like dismiss it. <clears throat> but he never left. And and I remember there's there's a sort of a statement that says, when God feels far away, it's not him that's moved. It's it's you. And that's exactly what I did. I'm the one that was like, leave me alone. I don't want any part of you, but he never moved. Um, <clears throat> so that's my little journey through my crisis of faith. So you you come out the other end of of the alcohol, the addiction, the the experience with your dad being murdered, the trial. You come out the other end of that, and you, you what's left for you? What do you find? Work, my my passion, my purpose, my calling, and I do you know, head first into doing that. Um, and now the, the stacking of traumatic incidents start. This mass casualty, this mass shooting, this natural disaster, this horrific fire, this um, just dead baby, raped women, like just, you know, horrible crimes against humanity. Um, I, was de- I was in head first with all of that. I think it's interesting because you're not a first responder, but, but you are going to each first responder's worst call and yeah. we're going, you know, there's that old cliche and, and, and I, I kind of get tired of hearing it. It was like, every time we see someone, it's their worst day ever, but yeah. you're doing that on a global level with each first responder. Yeah. And I, and to hear you go, you dealt with the, the uh, TSA agents after the shooting and you said 1500, how do you even debrief 1500 people, even with a team of, of, of clinicians, it, it's impossible. It was hard. It was hard. And we would have, you know, sometimes 10 people in a room and sometimes 50 people in a room. And there was like, I think there was three or four, maybe even five of us clinicians for five days yeah, that's... that did that. And we weren't together. We were all very individual. Um, and, and yeah, you know, you said it best um first responders see people on their worst day right and you're there a, a citizen's worst day is a first responder's every day but my worst my my every day is 
your worst day. Right. I'm saying it wrong. The first no. responder's worst day is my every day. Right. And and that's that's kind of why it stood out to me because you're not necessarily seeing those dead babies. You're not seeing right. that that well. We'll get to that because you did mention just this week that you did you did have an experience, but you, you're not necessarily seeing what we see, but you're you're seeing it through our, our eyes and our ears yeah. and when or, or excuse me and our voice when when they tell you, yeah. and so and it's the same yeah you you hear it and it does like you say we you know, we talked about that word stacking and and I thought that was very interesting because I don't think I'd heard that I I get it when we talked about it I kind of got the theory because you're talking about that compounding your traumas. Yeah. But um, yeah, so that was the one thing I said, yeah, we definitely need to talk about stacking. And so that that's what you do daily for yourself is it stacks on top for you. Every, every day. And, and, and I'm certainly not a complaint, but it's a recognizing of how impactful the work that I do is. Um, I'm not a run of the mill therapist or run of the mill trainer or instructor. Like I am in the field on your worst day. No, I don't show up on scene, but I show up to the station or the firehouse or uh, the office after and you describe it to me. And um, it, I get the visuals in my own mind. Like when we're talking, right, we're visualizing some of the things that they're saying. And so I would get these visions in my own mind. And and for the most part, I, within, you know, 12, 24 hours after a, a horrible, gnarly call, I would, I would sort of balance out, but it was always in the first day coming back from a horrible tragedy, line of duty death, which is the worst. And, and here in, in Southern California, we've had so many line of duty deaths. It's horrific. I've never seen so many. And <clears throat> I get sort of this, I don't want to hear people laughing because I want the world to stop. Like everyone should stop and mourn right now. Um, I remember being in the grocery store following a, a baby death call and I was in line and I heard people laughing and I just wanted to scream, shut up. Don't you know a baby just died today? And of course they didn't know. I, what's that? Of course they don't know. Right. Of course not. Right. And, 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 right. And, but I, I recognized, ooh, kind of feral after a, a call. Like I can't really be in public. I'm not really nice to be around. I just need to sort of withdraw and. And now I understand the withdrawal, the solitude, the, the shutting people out. And um, if, if I shared any of the negative effects of my job, let's say with my friends, they would just tell me, Dina, quit. Like, why do you do that job? It's too hard. It's too painful. Why would you expose yourself to all of that? And then I would feel so misunderstood and so like, you don't understand. This isn't a job. It's a calling. It's a purpose. It's a mission. And I am not a therapist that's going to sit behind a clipboard in an office for nine hours a day. It's just not me. Um, so I felt so alone. Like here I am struggling with the calls that I'm handling, but I can't offload them because when I do, the response is stop doing it. Stop, stop going to those calls. And I started to recognize some symptoms of burnout. I didn't know that it was burnout at the time, but I started to recognize it. Um, losing my filter uh, mm -hmm. when it came to gallows humor. You know, I was coming back from a dead baby call with a fire station and it was like midnight and someone, a friend of mine called me and said, hey, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm just coming back from a dead baby call. What are you doing? You want to grab pancakes? And he was like, what the, mm -hmm. what did you just say? Yeah. And that gasp, right? He gasped like, Whoa. what did you just say? And I was like, oh, shit. Like for you, it's, you're like, cool. Yeah, let's go get pancakes. Right. Go to that place with like the blueberry syrup. Like, exactly. What are you thinking? Right. It's a Tuesday. Yeah. But I recognize, whoa, like I, I can't assimilate into regular society. Like people don't understand this, this gallows humor, I had a detachment, I guess. And, um, but I started to also recognize like my sleep was crap. Um, and I would wake up, you know, I'd get a call at two in the morning. Hey, we had this incident. How, how quickly can you get here and, and go and, and do that? And then, you know, can you go to this incident in New Mexico or can you fly to that incident in Arizona? And yes, 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 yes. Right. And I started to recognize I was gaining weight. I wasn't sleeping well. I was eating like trash. I wasn't feeling good. I was tired all the time. 
and it was hurting. Like I was losing capacity to handle more. And um, Vegas, the Vegas shooting was a big one. Um, Because it was so big and so traumatic, it, it had a bigger impact. But also, I was not doing well you know, with all of the stacking of stuff and coming out of the, it was not far after the murder trial. And um, I was losing the ability to keep the stuff with the stuff, keep the stuff with the first responders and come home and, and not have it on my mind. It was bleeding into everything in my life. Um, I knew I needed to change. I needed to do something different. So what do you do? So what I, what I had to do was take a big step back. I could no longer um, manage the negative effects of uh, what I was experiencing, of, of not sleeping, irritable all the time, exhausted all the time, um, a lot of cynicism and the sarcasm that goes with the cynicism, which really separates us from other people. And and that's not me. Like I'm typically optimistic and full of gratitude. And I had lost all of that. Um, I was angry and I hated the world. And I started thinking, you know, you can't trust anybody and everybody sucks and is full of murderers. And, you know, the world is just hateful and I needed to step away. And so I took a pause, meaning I didn't want to be on call anymore. Um, so I stopped being on call and I took a, a full-time position with a, a large agency to develop a wellness program for them. And I mean, the irony of that, like I was the sickest I have ever right. been mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, and you're hiring me to build a wellness program. But it was exactly what I needed to get myself well. So I started referring to it as my get well job. And I, I gave everything and I researched every piece of wellness information and how do you build organizational wellness and what does that look like and what is burnout and how do you recover from it? And I lived in that project for three years and I would see clients on Saturdays I would occasionally take a um, a critical incident stress management um, call. In fact, in 2020, there were there were six pilots that died fighting fire. Hmm. Six pilots died in 2020 fighting fire. Um, I think I responded to like three of those, and it was it was always so odd and shocking to be headed to these big incidents, and this was in the heart of COVID, right? No one was traveling and everyone was masked up. And I was like, I'm traveling all of the time. Right. I'm I'm basically considered a first responder. Like, I think at one point I even had to like show like, yeah, I'm traveling because I'm headed to this incident. Here's my papers. Like, right. let me through, you know? Um, And, and so I, but my day job was getting myself well so that I could, build this project for this agency and and learn all about wellness and in the process get myself well it was fantastic it it was my get well job um and that ended in uh 21 no I'm sorry yeah where are we 23 yes in 21 end of 21 was when that ended and I came back to doing this full time doing all the things that I get to do now so how do you how do you prevent that burnout now? Yep. Yep. Very good. Because you're still stacking all the shit I, on top of all the shit. Yeah. But now I have a, a base of foundation of wellness that I filter everything through. So everything I do, every yes I say, um, every, every job I take, every Every yes I give is filtered through that foundation of wellness. Is this going to hurt me? Is this going to harm me? Can I compensate for it? You know, if I, let's say, you know, work 12 hours a day for five days in a row, what, what did the next five days look like? Can I recover from that? Can I rest? Um, I have wellness practices in place. I float on a regular basis. I do cold plunge 
on a regular basis. When I say regular basis, it's not daily. I don't, I don't have the ability to do that. I guess I could take a cold shower, but when I first got into cold plunging and float therapy, I was doing it several times a week to really build up this capacity. What it does is, you know, heal, it healed my body and it also healed, it opened up capacity to manage stressors as they came in. Um, I don't take 24 hour call anymore. So the boundaries that I had to put down were really hard at first. I remember the first time I said no. And um, I had been working at my office job, working on this wellness project. And the the company called me and said, hey, you know, we have we have a, a police officer, a higher patrol officer that is in distress. Can you get to him? How quickly can you get to him? And in my mind, I'm like, okay, I've already worked nine hours today. My daughter is at home waiting for me to come home. I'm really looking forward to putting on my jammies and cooking a meal. And, but this person needs me. And I had to, yeah, in that split second, I had to choose my wellness or, or his or, or who I was responding to. And I said, no, I'm sorry, I'm not available for that. And hung up the phone and immediately started sobbing yeah. because I wondered what is wrong with me? Why can't I say yes? Why, what, what it, how horrible that I am so selfish that I would choose me over this. And I remember I saw my therapist the next day and she sort of giggled and said, what do you think you're the only therapist on the planet? And I'm like, well, there isn't very many of us that work with the public safety. There just isn't very many of us. And she goes, someone else was called and that officer was helped. You didn't have to be the one that did it. And I, so basically I prioritize my wellness. I'm not always perfect. I sometimes burn the candle at both ends and then recognize, whoops, I probably shouldn't have done that. But I have the tools now to get back on the path of wellness. I strictly abide by a bedtime. I don't, I don't take overnight calls anymore. Um, uh, I say no a lot more than I ever have. Uh, that's a hard and, thing to get used to. Oh, it is. It was really hard to get used to. And and now it's it's a lot easier. I, I just recognize, I'm sorry, I'm not available for that. And and um thank you for the opportunity, but I, I'm I'm not gonna be able to to help with this one. Other times I will get, you know, if, if I get asked again, like, please, will you help us with this? Or please can you go to this? I might go. Okay, I'll, I'll sacrifice myself for this one. But, you know, eight out of 10 times I'm saying, no, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Which is hard because, again, I'm giving up exactly. right, income. I'm yeah. giving up any kind of stability or that paycheck. It's, it's the allure of overtime. But for me, like, all the work is overtime. <laughs> It's a, it's a balance. It's, it's an act and, a, and I guess for lack of a better word, a game. And, and mm -hmm. you have that, that benefit of, of creating your own schedule basically and, and yeah. allowing for that to happen and, and allowing yourself to be able to say no. And it's, so I was going to ask, like, how would you tell your clients if you're working with say a firefighter and how, how do you, how do you get them to, to take some of that self-care themselves, even though there's some schedules that don't allow for you to say, okay, no, I got to step away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I recognize that I have tremendous advantage to be able to say no and go to sleep when I want to. But so my, my messaging is this, you know, learn how to rest your body um, with some techniques, with some tools so that when you have the space to rest, let's say you come back from a call and it, you, whether you know it's going to be quiet or not, you're like, okay, I can rest right now. Then you're able to quickly turn that switch and power down and rest. Um, Dr. Andrew Huberman coined this term NSDR, non-sleep deep rest. And you can train your body to get there and do that. And there's, I'm seeing so many more, um, you know, um, sleep recovery, first responder sleep um, training to learn how to do that. No, you're not going to get eight hours. No, you're not going to be able to predict what time you go to bed and what time you wake up. But when you have the opportunity to rest and power down, take it and do it. And um, inflate some of these other wellness, wellness practices like 
meditation, like float therapy, which by the way, is zero gravity, Mm -hmm. um, lack of stimuli. So you're completely shutting down every piece of stimuli coming in your body, which gives you the best rest of your life. No tones are going to go off in that float pod. You know, no, nothing bad is going to happen to you. Like you're safe and you can just power down. Um, you know, dial in what you eat, dial in what you consume on your screen, uh, what you listen to. You know, there's so many things that you do have control over and you almost need control over more of those because there's so much of what you don't have control over as a first responder, right? When you're on shift, you don't, you, you can't say no, sorry, I don't want to take this one. I'm tired. Or I'm spent. I can't. <laughs> it, explain the the Huberman concept a little bit because I I do have a coworker who who uses it and and he's taught it to a couple other coworkers and so and I don't think I mean that's every episode that that Huberman does is such a deep dive into some pretty yeah. heavy su- subjects they're fascinating and enthralling but not 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 everybody can listen to three and a half four hours of it. Oh, I know. So, I mean, kind of, you don't have to teach us, but what, what is that, that technique? Yeah. So NSDR is the ability to power down your own body, um, sort of a, a body scan from head to toe, scanning for any kind of tension and releasing that, um, a breathing technique. You don't ever want to breathe too much or too little, but you want to find that harmonious breath. And it might take a few minutes to get there at first. You might not recognize, oh, I've been holding my breath for all day. Or, oh, I don't exhale all of the way. You know, let me open up my lung capacity. And so you, you're doing this body scan and giving your body the moment, the time, the space to shut down. I'm going to shut down right now. And no, it's not time to like, you know, black out your room and go to sleep, you know, and snuggle up in nighty night. But I might have 10 minutes that I can practice that to give my body the rest that it needs. It's, it's actually kind of a, it's a fascinating procedure. I, I, I have not done it myself. Uh, but I do have people that, that swear by it. And so it's something that I need to add into my, my repertoire the, of, of just some self-care. Absolutely. And, you know, it, 20, 30 years ago, this was sort of biofeedback. Mm-hmm. When biofeedback came on, on scene, I remember learning biofeedback in my 20s and recognizing, wow, this, is, this really is a restful thing. So that's exactly what's happening. It's tuning into the cues of your body and controlling them. Your body will follow your mind. Yeah, that's the whole concept behind the mind. body keeps the score, correct? Absolutely. Right. 100%. The issue is in the tissue. Right. Um, but the key is in your mind. And I want to touch on the float a little bit because the floats are are amazing. I, I will caution you if you have some vestibular issues, you probably don't want to do a float. but but a float is an amazing thing. It, I know that when I do them, um, I track my heart rate and everything, and, and it, it mimics a REM cycle for me when I go into a float. Oh, that's so cool. So, so yeah, I need to get a tracking device of some kind. I would love to see that. It does. And, and I watched the first time I did it, it blew me away because I, I remember thinking, oh, this isn't going to work. This isn't. And then, then I heard the, dong, the, the, the gong saying, you're done. And I was like, wait a second, which is I'm, I just just got in here. And then it was, I looked down and I was like, no, that was like 75 minutes. Wow. And it, my heart rate just went, it just plummeted and stayed down. And it was, Isn't it was, it amazing? It, yeah, it was an amazing thing. It was, it was pretty cool. So I highly suggest that the, the saunas and the cold bath as well. Um, yeah. like those are all these I, things that should be added to firehouses all across the country. Oh, yes. You talk about spending wellness dollars, like all over California. I don't know about in other states, but in California, all these public safety agencies are getting all this money for wellness. For the love of God, invest in saunas, float tanks, and cold plunges. Right. Like, and I'm, I'm cutting myself out of the equation. I see that, right? Don't give it to a therapist. <laughs> give it to these items. Bring a therapist in to coach you through it, right. or a coach to coach you through it. Um, but we don't need, I don't think we need more therapy. We need more wellness practices. That's what needs to happen. Um, and, and the caution again with the float therapy, I, I, I like your vestibular caution. The other caution is if you're not comfortable being alone with your thoughts, 
prepare for that first. That's a really good point. Yes. Cause you are there with just your thoughts. And it's, I remember the first one for me, I was almost having panic attacks. It was scary. Um, but worth it to get through it. All right. So what, what is everyday life like for you today? Everyday life is it's different every day, which is kind of nice. Um, if I can, um, and I say, if I can plan my schedule, then I know what that might look like. But I could get a call, let's say, from the U.S. Forest Service saying, you know, we had a firefighter killed on this fire. Can you come and assist us with the peer support team? And um, I might need to drop everything and go. If I say yes, I can say no. Um, I try not to with them. Um, so everyday life might look like um, teaching at the academy in the morning seeing some clients in the afternoon. Um, some days I stay home and just see clients over video, over telehealth. And other days I go into an office and see clients in person. Like today when we're done, I'll go into the office and see a client. Um, tomorrow I'll be on vacation for a week, which that only happens like once a year. <laughs> um, other weeks I'll be in a city and teaching basic peer support for three days or advanced peer support uh, and then traveling, you know, to and from there. Um, so I get to do so many cool things. And for the most part, I have control over my schedule. Um, I won't see more than four, five clients at the most in a day, um, maybe three days a week. Uh, the other two days are either teaching or working on my own projects, uh, developing curriculum and uh, things like that. Yeah. So it works out pretty well, huh? Yeah. So and that's my work life. So, and, and then what I do for myself, I, I wake up real slow. So I usually have two hours in the morning to just sort of drink coffee, hang out, read, think about my day, get ready kind of slow. Um, and I really, if I have control over it, I end my day by three. Um, if I'm teaching, then of course it's, it's an all day eight to five thing. Right. Um, but um, I will float or do a cold plunge on a Saturday. Um, I see my therapist on Wednesday afternoons. Um, yeah, that's that's what I do. So now I come to an end with this because I know you do have to get in at, at some point and see see a client this afternoon, and, and I'm not going to take up all of your day. My last two questions I've asked everybody, and the first one is about an everyday carry. Um, I don't know if I explained to you where the title of the show came from when we talked on the phone. I don't think you did. Uh, there's a novel out there by Tim O'Brien and it's called The Things They Carried. And it's a Viet it's a novel about Vietnam and it talks about a platoon. Basically, the, the law, uh, I don't know, synopsis of it. It's a platoon in Vietnam, talks about the things they might carry into battle. Uh, you know, the machine gun, aid bag, radio, whatever it is. But it also kind of talks about those scars and, and, and traumas they take away from, from a battle or, a, or a, a patrol. And so I had a friend of mine re remind me of the book because I read it when it came out. And then this friend, a uh, coworker, reminded me of the book um, about two years ago. And I said, that's perfect. So I bastardized that into the things we all carry. So it, it kind of goes in line with we carry aid bag or fire you know, with the nozzle into a fire or the set of irons or whatever we carry into a fire. But it's always or, or whatever call. And we bring something out with us every time we we leave a call. So um, I always I just like to ask everybody, what's an everyday carry that you kind of if you leave home without you kind of feel naked. Um, and this might sound a little cheesy um, because it's not a not a material object. It's it's my my attitude, which is gratitude. Um, every day, you know, gratitude really for me sets the stage. Um, it's my comfort. It's, it's my fallback. It's my default. It's what I go back to when I'm struggling. I find things that I'm grateful for. Um, small moments, big moments, it doesn't matter. Gratitude is, is the thing that I, I have to carry for my own wellness, my own mental health and sanity. Um, yeah. Gratitude. You, well, you'd be surprised how many people pick something that, that isn't physical. And, and that's why I ask it's a, it's a different answer all the time. And, and that's why I ask it. Cause it's, it's always fascinating to hear what people have to come up with. And some people have a very certain everyday carry and it's, and it is a physical item. So that's, it's again, it, it runs the gamut. 
All right. So we'll finish up with a book. What What is a book you've read that you want to share with the audience? You know, I, I had been thinking about your question. I'm like, how on earth do I pick just one? Mm-hmm. Like just one is really hard. Um, I love books. Um, trying to work on more entertainment reading rather than learning reading. But thinking about that question, the first book that came to mind was The Four Agreements. Uh, The Four Agreements was, to me, just a foundational book for uh, living life, recognizing what's important. Um, um, But most recently, a book that I read that I would love for people to know about and and even listen is Never Finished by David Goggins. Okay. It was fantastic. Phenomenal book. It's better than Can't Hurt Me. So if you've never listened or read, I listen to audiobooks. I drive a lot. But Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins was fantastic. It was the kick in the pants that I needed for my own wellness um, uh, path that I took. But Never Finished is 10 times better. It's so good. Well, you're the first one to, you're the first one to offer up uh, that, that, that David Goggins book. So that's, I appreciate that. It's so good. It's, it's all the things that Can't Hurt Me didn't have. Um, can't hurt me as hard in your face, you know, get your shit together. Mm-hmm, right. No one's coming to save you. Right. And I was like, ouch, harsh. <laughs> yeah. It's what I needed. So mm-hmm. honestly, it resonated with me. But I recognize as a therapist, I'm like, damn, dude, this is going to hurt a lot of people. And this is mean, like you're harsh. Never finished fills in that gap. He acknowledges this sucks. This is painful. This is hard. This can break you. Like, like acknowledges and validates that and then comes up with this is what I have done this is what's worked for me this is how I do it this is my mindset now um and sort of puts it as a you can do what you want this what's work this is what works for me I'm never finished um and I love listening to it listening to it on audio because you get the bonus of little mini podcasts between chapters Mm -hmm. with him and the the author who's the narrator who's reading it. It's really, really good. Interesting. Okay. Well, we'll put that out there. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was about an hour and a half and I appreciate every minute of it. That's amazing. I, I hope it was valuable. I hope it it's useful. If, if And if it helps, encourages, empowers one person, then it was worth it, right? I'm going to want to pick your brain a little bit more um, and we can do it via Instagram message or whatever because I want to, I want to talk some more about the peer support part that you're doing. Uh, and so if you don't mind, uh, you, you know, it, obviously Absolutely. you're going on vacation that, that for the next week. So it, at any time that you, you have time to kind of share a little bit of that, I'd love to pick your brain about it. So anytime, anytime, anytime. Awesome. All right. Well, go enjoy the rest of your day and then go enjoy your vacation. Thank you so much. We're out. Thanks for listening to another episode of The Things We All Carry. Head over to the website, thethingsweallcarry.com for show notes, resources, and to sign up for the newsletter. Until next week, take care of yourselves and remember to check in on each other.